Barbara Slavin. I'm a distinguished fellow here uh, working on the Middle East. Um, when I scheduled this event uh, many weeks ago, I optimistically thought we would be talking about the end of the war in Gaza and what would follow. Uh, that Israeli hostages would have been released and there would be a massive humanitarian effort underway to deal with the, uh, the catastrophe in Gaza. Unfortunately, uh, the war is still going on as we speak. It's almost six months now. And this is certainly the longest war that Israel has fought since its war for independence, and it's frankly the bloodiest. Um, it is obvi obviously very difficult, and even if we had a ceasefire, it would be difficult to talk about the so-called day after. Um, even if the fighting stops now, thousands more Palestinians, especially children, are likely to die of hunger and disease. Uh, Jared Kushner may covet Gaza's Mediterranean beachfront, but uh, by some estimates, it will take eight years just to remove the rubble from the current conflict, uh, let alone begin to rebuild. It's unclear who will govern the territory, who will pay for reconstruction, and how Israeli and Palestinian society and politics uh, will recover and evolve. So it's, it's a pessimistic note on which we begin, but I think it's, it's very important to take stock of where we are and try at least to see a little bit into the future. So we've assembled hopefully four speakers, we're still waiting for one, um, who are deeply versed in the Israel-Palestine conflict, as well as Israeli politics, U.S.-Israel relations, and regional dynamics. And I'm going to pose a few questions uh, to each of them. Uh, then we'll take some questions from those who are here with us at Stimson. Those online can submit questions at stimson.org slash questions, and we'll get to uh, as many of them as we can uh, in the next hour and a half. Uh, and we're going to try to keep this discussion as civil as possible. We know that there are a lot of emotions, but uh, we want to be civil and constructive. Um, now, uh, we're waiting for Meirev Zonsan, who is in Israel, but um, she uh, has had some, some technical difficulties. So I'm going to go to uh, someone who I have followed for many, many years and who is well known and respected here in Washington. And that's Shibli Talhami, the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland and Director of the University of Maryland uh, Critical Issues Poll. Um, Shibley, uh, I would like you to just give us a brief uh, update on, on the situation on the ground as you see it, and then talk about the shifting public opinion that we're seeing uh, about the war, uh, particularly in the United States where we've just seen some interesting poll results. So over to you, Shibley. Uh, thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you for hosting me, and I'm really uh, pleased to join this panel. Um, so let me start with with the part about public opinion, uh, because it really goes to the heart of the matter, particularly in terms of what uh, President Biden has been facing at home, and particularly now as he is um, waging a re-election campaign. Uh, I don't think he uh, could have expected a where we are, um, you know, nearly six months into the war, uh, and where the American public is. Uh, and I want to start by just references, referencing uh, May 2021. Um, this was um, only a few months after uh, Biden had come to office. He obviously came um, with an anti-Trump agenda that highlighted democracy and human rights, uh, was backed by uh, a lot of young people, um, uh, uh, and, and different segments of the Democratic Party and others uh, in, in supporting him. And then he faces a major crisis in May um, uh, of 2021 uh, when there was a um, uh, attempt to, to force Palestinians out of their homes in East Jerusalem. It generated a major crisis with Hamas, which uh, launched rockets against Israel, and then Israel bombarded Gaza um, resulting in more than 200 uh, dead and, and 12 Israelis uh, dead uh, in, in that episode. And what was really visible during that um, crisis, which obviously now in, in historical perspective in comparison 
to what we now face is um, uh, considerably smaller. But what was obvious at the time was that the president was really clearly out of touch with um, American public opinion even then. Uh, and you could see that uh, at the time he did not condemn what too many people, what the human rights organization called war crimes. He did not um, work hard to end that conflict quickly to the point that many mainstream uh, uh, members of Congress in his own party who typically weigh in more in favor of Israel than against uh, basically uh, uh, pushed him to uh, make more efforts to uh, to end the conflict. And um, I think that what happened at that time, I, um, uh, I did a poll uh, right after um, that, that war ended. Uh, and what was um, interesting is that I wrote, I wrote two articles about it, um, uh, one for the Brookings Institution, one uh, for um, the Boston Globe, um, about how that uh, conflict actually hurt him, um, even in, in May 2021. And I, I think these people were not prepared to listen carefully. What we found was that um, a majority of Americans disapproved of his handling of the Gaza war but especially, more importantly, a large percentage of Democrats, including nearly half of Democrats, who disapproved of his handling of that war. And in interestingly, that's the time when we find that nationally, the president's numbers start to decline, his, his uh, approval ratings start declining. At the very same time, right immediately, um, you know, after the the Gaza war. Now, of course, uh, there are many reasons why his numbers started declining. They're not all related to Gaza. But what's interesting here is most of the drop in, in May, June uh, of uh, uh, 2021 of, of the president's numbers came from Democrats, especially young Democrats. Uh, so there was very good reason to think that it was probably correlated to his stance even then. And so I think the, pro the president has had a problem, particularly with his democratic constituency on an Israel-Palestine policy, even before the horrific attack by Hamas on October 7, and then the uh, uh, bombardment uh, of, of Gaza by, by Israel. Um, so I think one of the things that we see, uh, certainly since October, uh, is in a way initially when you had the horrific attack and obviously a lot of Israeli civilian casualties that was covered well in our media. It was the first two weeks. It was mostly focused on the Hamas attack and the Israeli casualties. And there was a spike in sympathy for Israel in the U.S. So we conducted a poll repeating a question we have asked over the years about whether the public wants the U.S. to take uh, to lean toward Israel, to lean toward the Palestinians, or to lean toward neither side. And we saw an obvious spike in comparison, say, with June of 2023, which was the last time we had a poll on that issue, a spike of sympathy for Israel, um, including among Democrats. Uh, in fact, from poll to poll, that was the largest single spike we had done, we had, we had observed for years. Still, though, keep in mind, that that spike uh, uh, happened across the board, Republican, Democrats, and independents, except among young Democrats, when there was no spike of support for Israel, according to that early poll right after the Hamas attack. Uh, but we also keep in mind, while there was a spike, still a majority of Democrats and a majority of independents wanted the U.S. to be even-handed, even then, even as the minority who wanted the U.S. to take Israel's side increased, um, and those who wanted to take the Palestinian side slightly decreased uh, in the first two weeks. Two weeks later, we conducted another poll on this issue, and what we found was that uh, much of the support that Israel had gained had really disappeared, uh, declined considerably two weeks later, um, but especially among young Democrats where uh, the support for Israel diminished to even levels uh, that were higher than before uh, the October 7 
uh, attack. So um, obviously there have been a lot of polling uh, in um, since then by so many other uh, uh, polling uh, outfits um, showing um, first a partisan divide on this issue, uh, particularly as the war went on and the horror in Gaza became clear uh, and people started blaming Israel and American support for Israel for what's transpiring in Gaza. I want to stop you. Shibley, if yeah. I can stop you just for, for a minute, I wanted to draw your attention to a poll that just came out today and, and get some historical perspective on this because there have been times in the past when Americans have been angry at the Israelis for brief periods of time over, over certain wars or other incidents, but this is a new Gallup poll that shows that 55% of Americans disapprove of Israeli actions. Only 36% approve, 75% of Democrats disapprove, and 60% of independents. As somebody who's been doing this issue for so long, have you ever seen numbers like that? No, I have not. Um, and, and in fact, you know, we have, uh, as you know, I've been studying this for decades, literally for decades. Some of these questions I've, I've asked the first time in the late 1980s. Um, and so we have I've already been documenting a remarkable trend that has taken place over the years with more and more Democrats, uh, um, you know, walking away from uh, supporting Israel, increasing, increasing sympathy for the Palestinians. But still overwhelmingly, even Democrats overwhelmingly wanted the U.S. to be even handed. It isn't like it translated into major support where we saw the increasing support for the Palestinians coming largely from young people, especially young Democrats, but even young evangelicals, as I wrote about this and I did a, a poll among evangelicals, even young evangelicals being young. But on this scale, we have not seen it before. And, and this is something I wanna just, and thank you for bringing that. I actually have not seen that poll um, uh, this morning, but I, I wanna say something here that's really relevant because you know, in, the, in our own discourse over the past, since October, We've, been, we've always seen huge demonstrations, um, uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people turning up in, in American cities. And very often these are labeled as Muslim and Arab Americans. Of course, Muslims and Arab Americans are mobilized, but that is not really what's happening. Of course, Arab and Muslim Americans are key constituency, they're gonna matter in Michigan. Uh, and, and obviously we've seen that in, in, in more ways than one. But this is far more pervasive. Um, um, huge segments of the Democratic Party, you know, um, especially young people, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, women, the kind of segments of, of, that we have seen over the year, uh, uh, more motivated by social justice and human rights issue than by strategic issues. And, and that's, in fact, one poll I have not released yet shows that two thirds of Americans including a majority of Republicans, want the U.S. to champion, uh, to, make, to make human rights a, a, a goal of American foreign policy. And when you ask them um, how, uh, you know, sort of what is the best way to advocate, uh, to push for human rights, they say rely on international organizations and be a model for the world. Those are the two top answers for not just for Democrats, but also for Republicans. So we have something really big. So when Michigan, you had 13%, over 100,000, uh, uh, you know, vote uncommitted in a primary as a protest uh, of, of Biden's position. They said, well, that's Arab and Muslim Americans. We go to Minnesota, there were 19% who voted uncommitted in protest, said, oh, that's the biggest Somali uh, you know, community in the U.S. Yes, they are. That's one and a half percent of the entire Minnesota population. You get 19 percent vote uncommitted. You got hundreds of thousands of people in the streets with dozens of organizations that have nothing to do with Arab and Muslim Americans and still labeled as if it was just like a. So, no, something big is going on. And obviously, uh, I think the the administration and, and, and certainly the president's campaign uh, are kind of getting a little bit of sense of it. I don't think enough, uh, and 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 trying to change them. But something big has happened. Uh, now, if you like me to, I could I could speak to Palestinian Israeli public opinion, but I'm hold off here. Let me, let me stop you there for a minute because I see that we've been joined by Mayor Avzonsign, an Israeli American journalist and senior Israel analyst with the International Crisis Group. And I I I want to go to you and just you know the the events are dizzying. 
we try to follow them as best as we can from here, but obviously you and Israel are much better place to tell us where we are in terms of um, the, the actual conflict on the ground, uh, what is Israel doing in Gaza at this point. Uh, we see that the ceasefire talks appear to have, have broken down. Uh, and also just the political dynamics in, in Israel, because we do see that the rift between the U.S., at least between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu administration, uh, has grown uh, certainly in the last couple of days. So if you could just briefly tell us where we are, we'd be very grateful. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks. First of all, apologies, especially to the audience there that I'm late. I thought it was a seven-hour difference, but I didn't process that there was daylight saving, so I apologize for that. Um, but I'm glad I could make it in time. Um, and it's good to be here with these colleagues. Um, so look, there's a lot to cover. I'll, I'll try to kind of give you a picture of where we are now. We're almost six months in. Um, basically, Israel, as we have heard, doesn't have a good strategy for what to do once it has eradicated or largely removed Hamas. And what we're seeing in the Gaza Strip right now is kind of a holding pattern in which, on the Israeli side, on the Palestinian side, of course, there's no holding pattern to speak of. But from the Israeli approach, they are committed to removing Hamas um, as a military power and as a governing power. And they have made, as far as they're concerned, some achievements, and they continue to insist that it will take a very long time. So when somebody like me analyzes the situation, I don't see those strategic breakthroughs happening, but they insist that it's something that it will take a long time. And they're talking about deep, deep regime change and what Netanyahu calls de-radicalization. Um, now, I, you know, my analysis is that it's not going very well for them, but regardless, Israel has not had a strategy for who is supposed to fill the vacuum uh, once Hamas is not there. And the mass starvation that we're seeing and the suffering is as a result of this inability to find an alternative. Um, and even if Israel agreed to the Biden doctrine of trying to have some kind of revitalized or restructured PA, there would still be the same issue. So even if Israel paid lip service to some kind of you know, for forward thinking paradigm that could maybe serve certain interests and maybe de-escalate some of the situation, ultimately Israel doesn't have a good plan now, some people think that's primarily because Netanyahu is interested in dragging this out, which he is, and that he's interested in an endless war, which I think he is. Uh, but I think that that strategic uh, challenge that Israel faces in Gaza and the reason why Israel never went into Gaza in this way, and f as far as it's concerned, it felt like it was compelled to do so after October 7th, is because it doesn't have a good solution for Gaza. It doesn't have a good answer for Gaza. And unfortunately, I don't see right now another way going other than prolonged uh, occupation of Gaza. Um, and Israel might have to, depending on how bad the situation gets there. Uh, I don't think Israel thinks it's as bad as some of the world might think it is as far as the threat of famine. But if it gets that bad, there might have to be a situation in which, since there's nobody else, uh, that the IDF itself will have to go in and start administering the day-to-day -day life there. Uh, I think they're really are very, they're confused and they're frustrated and the military I'm talking about, and they, they feel like the leadership of Netanyahu is obviously not serving their interests, but I think they also have, they don't have good answers right now uh, for what to do in Gaza. I don't think anyone, you know, under, everyone understands that Israel has military power and it can go in and, and kind of do as it pleases and it's, it's destroyed Gaza, I mean, it's made Gaza uninhabitable. And now it's dealing with the consequences of that. And so that's um, an issue that there is no easy answer to. Um, as far as the ceasefire talks, <clears throat> uh, they, they are stuck. And I think Israeli public sentiment is that Netanyahu is not interested in a hostage deal, uh, either because the price would be too high uh, to pay and his far right would, would leave, which I do think is plausible. Um, but he's also not interested because any kind of ceasefire will allow for time for people to refocus their efforts on getting him out of office. And most of the country wants him out of office and hold him responsible for what's happening. Um, and it's the mood in Israel is really uh, is really stark and it's been this way for quite a while. Um, and in some ways, the domestic crisis overshadows uh, the crisis in Gaza. In Israel, there isn't so much attention to the disaster in, in Gaza, there's much more attention to how Israelis are supposed to regain their security 
and regain a political leadership that they believe in. Um, so on the ceasefire talks, I think the situation has been quite consistent that Israel wants to continue to operate for a long period of time and have freedom of operation, um, indefinite security control, as Netanyahu calls it, uh, whereas Hamas has insisted a full withdrawal of troops and a clear timeline um, for an end to the war. Uh, so I think though that's the real sticking point. I mean, we can get into the details of the other aspects, but that, I, I, that remains, as far as I can see, the main issue here. If you could also just say a word or two about the, the latest tensions with, with the U.S. I mean, is Netanyahu benefiting at all from this? We've had, we had the abstention at the U.N. Uh, yeah. for the first time. Uh, does, that, does that help him, hurt him, or does it not really have much thinks, of an impact? Yeah. He thinks it helps him. I mean, he thinks he's positioning himself. He thinks he's projecting power, I assume. He also, I think, probably understands after so many years of impunity that he doesn't believe there actually is a real price to pay. I don't think the U.S. is going to abandon Israel uh, in its war in Gaza or in its wars in the north or elsewhere. So he has that leeway to do that. And for him, it's pandering to a political base that, uh, you know, has this illusion that it doesn't need the U.S. when clearly it does. But that standing up to the U.S. is a projection of power. I mean, he even said it today. He said... The reason I'm doing this is to send a message to Hamas. Uh, now, I mean, you know, we can argue about how much bullshit that is or not, but um, that's how he's positioning himself. And the more isolated Israel becomes, the more the far right um, kind of grows in Israel as, oh, the whole world is against us. So we need to fight harder. We need to fight longer. We need to fight stronger. So that's kind of the reaction. Whether or not it'll actually help him in the polls, I don't know. The, the Economist cover this uh, this past week was Israel uh, alone, which is not exactly true. Um, and, uh, right. you know, despite the, the, the various signs of, of irritation we've seen between the U.S. and, uh, and Israel. And an expert on that topic is our next speaker, uh, Lara Friedman, um, who has taught me uh, so much and, uh, on this topic over the years. Uh, Lara is president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. She's a former U.S. Foreign Service officer and previous director of policy and government relations at Americans for, for Peace Now. So feel free to react to, to what Merov and, and Shibley have said, but I also want to get a sense of your reaction to those new poll results. What are you seeing, uh, particularly on Capitol Hill? Uh, was it a week ago, only a week ago, that... Chuck Schumer, the most senior elected Jewish official in the United States, made a rather stunning speech uh, in which he warned that Israel was in danger of becoming a, a pariah state. Um, he's obviously gotten some flack for that, uh, but, uh, but also some praise. So, you know, where do you see U.S.-Israel relations now in terms of your expertise here in Washington? Thank you for the question, and thanks to the two previous speakers. This is a great panel. I'm looking forward to hearing Ali also. Um, I, I think a lot already has been said about this. Uh, you know, the question of where U.S. Um, public opinion is um, seems to be pretty settled. The polling is clear. The uncommitted votes in the primaries. Um, Democratic public opinion is clearly moved beyond, I think, what the Biden administration understood um, was happening. I think this has weirdly taken them as a surprise. I say weirdly because I think most um, political analysts who are viewing this without a, a preconceived idea of what public opinion has to be were not surprised. Um, and again, what Shibley was saying, if you look at the protests, mm -hmm. the protests are not just Palestinian, Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans. This is about um, rights and values and social justice. Um, and it's been coming for a long time. And it, you know, people hate the word intersectional, but it is related to what I think a generation, uh, multiple younger generations of Americans see as a question of fundamental values and not having a values exception for anything, including Israel. Um, so I think that kind of took a lot of the democratic leadership, which maybe only listens to its own instincts and a set of in-house um, consultants, sort of, and telling what they would want to hear on Israel. Um, I think that took them by surprise. Um, that doesn't necessarily translate to any shifts in policy so far. And I think it's really important to, you know, my grandma would say, listen, listen to people's words, but watch their feet. Um, the Schumer speech, I think, is a good example of this. It's, it was a shock. It was a powerful speech. Um, I will note that he focused on Bibi. Um, this is not 
uh, dissimilar to what the Biden administration previously did when they had their order for sanctions on settlers. There are issues that they and their consultants know well are particularly unpopular with Democratic voters and particularly unpopular even with liberal Zionist Democrats, the, the Democrats, that the, the, the voters who care about Israel that they care about the most. Um, settlers, settlements are not a popular issue. BB is not a popular leader. So um, having a policy of putting some sanctions on settlers is a way of, maybe they thought, letting off some steam without actually taking on the policy of Israel and Gaza, which is what has the grassroots engaged. A speech by Schumer challenging whether BB is a good leader, um, again, popular amongst a lot of American uh, Jewish voters and supporters of Israel, doesn't actually challenge anything that's happening in Gaza. Um, and if you look at the actual policies, the watching the feet, um, that speech was a little over a week ago. In the meantime, we've seen a total ban on funding to UNRWA for at least a year. And okay, fine, it wasn't a permanent ban and it doesn't use the word terrorism and there's, there's some, I don't want to say silver linings in the way that was framed, but the bottom line is we have a, a famine, right? Every serious organization and expert that judges food security says there is either a famine or incipient famine, probably too late to even prevent mass deaths, and the Congress just barred aid to the only organization that has the capacity on the ground to actually deal with this. In parallel, that same bill gave around $4 billion of completely unconditional military aid to Israel. That's direct funding for which they can buy weapons and ammunition and other things, including funding they can use offshore, a chunk of it in Israel. And that's uh, you know actual cooperation agreements with the Department of Defense, again, for weapons. Yeah, just to stop you though, that's part of that 10-year agreement that it Obama is. signed but, but right the back in 2016. It is, it is, it's part of the MOU, but that doesn't mean in the context of an ongoing um, genocide being committed with U.S. weapons, that Congress couldn't, for instance, put some reports on that, some conditions, some limitations, at least some language suggesting concern. There's nothing. Um, again, this is the watching the feet. Um, the, the fact that Congress right now, and I'm going to say Democrats in Congress, are jumping in with both feet, joining in with Republicans in what is a clear illiberal targeting of academia, of you know, DEI, the, the, the liberal views that they hate in Congress, but they're framing it now as a fight against anti-Semitism, which is code for we need to stop criticism of Israel, of Israel and protest on campuses. But by making it about ostensibly anti-Semitism, Democrats are joining in. So again, listening to the words but watching the feet. I feel like what we're seeing now with um, the Schumer speech, um, I think Biden yesterday was quoted as saying in, a, in an event when someone asked about the protesters who keep interrupting his, his public events, he said, well, they have a point, um, suggesting we need to do more on Gaza. I get, you get, you get a sense they're trying to, to give some, some breathing room for yeah. a grassroots which is outraged. But I don't think from what I've seen and from people I've engaged with, that is yet going to translate into any shift in policy and absent a shift in policy, I don't think it actually makes a difference for the grassroots that's enraged at watching children dying. I mean, we're seeing pictures now of, of you know, children starving to death. Um, it, it's, it, you know, someone said once, like, there can't be a famine there. We're not seeing Somalia-style pictures. Well, we're seeing them now. Yeah. Um, and we don't see anything yet to suggest that leadership in Congress are listening to their progressive um, colleagues, because there are progressives in Congress pushing hard on this and have been for months. And we don't see any sign that the Biden administration, I mean, yes, they abstained at the UN Security Council, and then they immediately framed that abstention in language that literally destroys the value of UN Security Council moves. UN, yeah, UN Security Council resolutions, by definition, are binding. That doesn't mean they're enforceable. Um, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand the difference between binding and enforceable. This administration basically tried to take the sting out of the abstention by destroying the entire idea of, of accountability under UNSC moves. It, it's just, it's baffling. And then in parallel, they issued a, a, a finding that Israel is not in any way violating U.S. law. Well, U.S. funding law says that you cannot give aid to a country that is blocking the movement of humanitarian aid. Everybody working on the ground says Israel is blocking the movement of humanitarian aid. The U.S. has decided they've got reassurances from Israel, so they're okay with it. And I will say one last thing. The, the, the part that is most maddening about this, and I think it's for, for any of us who followed the, the, the Obama administration's engagement with Israel on this, 
Um, it, it, you know, it feels like the Biden administration learned all the wrong lessons from the Obama administration. The key lesson they seemed to learn was don't clash with Israel on anything, as opposed to the lesson being if you try to stand up even a tiny bit, you're going to pay the exact same cost in political capital as if you'd actually had a policy and defended it and done something meaningful that could actually change what's happening and defend U.S. national security. There is another way right now, right? The Biden administration could actually shift policy. The price they would pay in terms of outrage from Israel, I mean, we heard the language from Meirat. The, the Israeli government's framing this as abandoning Israel, right? Even though we're doing everything the same, but there's a little language. The Republican Party is dining out on this. Democrats, or so-called Democrats, who are very, very strong on pro-Israel, Dershowitz tweeted out yesterday, he'll never vote for Biden now, because Biden is abandoning Israel. Was he going to vote for I, I don't know if he was before, but he, see, he tweeted that. So you're paying the same price as if you actually had shifted policy. Mm. And, and, you know, it's too late to undo six months of, 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 of deaths, right? For, for people who are looking at this and saying, you supported genocide, I can never vote for you, I don't think that's going to change. But for, for those who are looking and saying, I can't vote for you knowing that if I vote for you, I'm voting for four more years of support, for a, a, four more years of absolute contempt for Palestinian lives, for Arab lives, for, for your values, an actual shift in policy to say, you know, if you vote for me, actually I'm putting some, some, some backbone into a different approach could make a difference. I don't think they think that's true. And I, at so far, it almost seems like they think they can, they can manage this with some cosmetic, sh some cosmetic language while they continue full steam ahead, um, provisioning genocide, defending genocide, not allowing the international community to do anything to help stop or, or prevent further deaths. Wow. <laughs> what I like about you, Laura, and always have, is that you, you do not waste time and you get straight, straight to the point. I will yeah. say in defense of poor Chuck Schumer, who I actually went to college with and remember for wearing khaki pants and blue blazers and button-down shirts in 1970, mind you. He, he already knew where he was going, but he did say something that I thought was, was very important, so I, I wanted to, to give him his due. Um, he said in his speech, it wasn't just that Israel was in danger of becoming a pariah state. Oh, I have to find this now. And I had it and I've lost it. Um, but he, he basically said that, yeah, here it is. We must be better than our enemies lest we become them. And, uh, you know, that was a, it may just be words, it may not be feet. Uh, but it was a welcome, it was a welcome I, comment I will just from say that, that may be just words, but if you're a Palestinian, or someone who cares about Palestinian lives listening to that, it's basically more shade. It's, it, it's basically saying the Palestinians are, are horrible, terrible and we don't but want to we become be as bad as they are as while yeah. you're literally engaged yeah. in a war on Gaza that has destroyed 75% of the houses and has the entire population facing famine and more than 30,000 dead. So it really, it, it, it's aimed at a very narrow part of the democratic base. I know Where part. appealing to support for Israel, do this because it's good for Israel, yeah. is the framing as opposed to do this because it's U.S. For support for genocide is a terrible look. All right. Well, um, <laughs> uh, I want to pull away a little bit from the Israel and Gaza, Israel, U.S. focus and, and go to Ali. Uh, Vaez, uh, senior advisor to the president and project director Iran for the International Crisis Group and someone who, whose judgment on the wider regional issues I have long learned to, to trust. Uh, while all of this is going on, we still have skirmishes uh, across the Lebanon border, uh, some I believe just this morning. Uh, we had a, a spate of attacks by Iran-backed militia groups in Syria and Iraq. Uh, on Americans, the death of three Americans at the end of January. That seems to have subsided after quite a vigorous U.S. response. We still have the Houthis uh, menacing shipping in the Red Sea. Um, what is your sense of whether this, this terrible war in Gaza is going to become a regional war? And you know, will Iran, with all the problems it's facing, allow that to happen, get dragged into it, sucked into it? What's your best sense of that? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Barbara, for organizing uh, another fantastic discussion. Uh, it's an honor to be on the panel with uh, Laura Shipley and, of course, my own colleague, uh, Mayra. Um, look, I think, uh, uh, let me 
formulate it this way. There are two pieces of good news here and two pieces of bad news. Uh, now, you'll, you'll judge at the end uh, which, which uh, side uh, is, is heavier. Um, the good news is that the two main actors here, Iran and the U.S., just by definition do not want uh, escalation and expansion of this conflict. And so a certain degree of de-escalation happens just by default, even without give and take or without coordination or without deconfliction. It's just simply because these two actors have made it clear uh, through direct and indirect channels of communication that, uh, that they don't want uh, uh, this war to expand beyond uh, Gaza. Uh, the second piece of good news is that now uh, we've heard reportedly that there have been two meetings between the White House's Middle East coordinator, Brett McKirk, and uh, Iranians in Oman, once in January and once in March. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a valuable... Sorry, again in March. Apparently. Uh, oh, so, that's right. And, and that, that, is a, uh, that is good news because uh, I think it allows for both sides to figure out ways of bringing down the temperature and it helps avoid misunderstandings or, or miscommunication, which often occurs when you operate through uh, intermediaries. Now, the bad news is, uh, number one, uh, uh, if you look at where de-escalation has happened, is where uh, Iran has more influence, more command and control over some of these actors, for instance, Shia militias in Iraq uh, that are not even necessarily funded by the Iraqi government as, as part of the Hashd al-Shabi, but they're actually on Iranian payroll. Um, and after the Tower 22 incident, Iran was able to pull the plug uh, and rein them in, uh, by the way, even before the U.S. retaliated. Um, uh, and we saw in the U.S. retaliation also uh, a degree of cautiousness uh, to respond in a way that was much more assertive compared to previous uh, U.S. retaliatory acts, but in a way that it would not result in uncontrolled escalation. So again, that's... Uh, 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 overall, I think, positive, but uh, there are actors here that uh, uh, have less degree of uh, command and control with Iran. Chief among them, the Houthis. Yeah. Uh, the Houthis are undeterrable. Uh, they are not an Iranian uh, proxy. Uh, they, in fact, have a long track record of ignoring Iranian advice. Um, and, uh, you know, we might very well wake up uh, one morning and see that the Houthis have done something uh, that is not coordinated with Iran and has resulted in the kind of casualties that would be very difficult uh, to, to uh, look the other way uh, and would result in uncontrolled escalation. Um, and the last piece of bad news is that we're not out of the woods yet, um, yeah. right? So. Uh, yes, we have had six weeks of relative quiet in Iraq and Syria. Um, but, uh, you know, imagine in the best case scenario, we get uh, a ceasefire uh, in Gaza, probably a temporary one, right? Um, would that result in uh, Israel turning its attention to the north, right? Because we know Hezbollah has said, if there is a ceasefire in Gaza, we will stop our attacks. Israel has not said the same thing. In, in fact, it has said the opposite, that mm. if, there is, uh, if, if uh, Hezbollah is not pushed away from the border, uh, that Israel will continue uh, its attacks in order to uh, allow uh, the citizens who have been displaced from the north to return back to their homes. Uh, that's an unworkable formula uh, for Hezbollah, it appears at this stage. Uh, whether that would change later on, we don't know. But even a ceasefire is not a guarantee that the northern border will be quiet. Um, the Houthis have also said they would stop if there is a ceasefire, but uh, they've now learned that they have a very powerful uh, tool in their hands uh, to project power in the Red Sea. Um, uh, and uh, Yemen conflict has its own dynamics, so it's quite possible that, uh, uh, that, that, that we, would, we would still uh, see escalation there. Uh, and of course, in a scenario that eventually, at some point, there is a ground incursion into Rafa, mm. Um, I can guarantee already sitting here without any doubt that you would see resumption of attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. Uh, this uh, uh, ceasefire that we have right now uh, on that front is not permanent. Uh, it is temporary. Uh, and it's because the conflict in uh, Gaza uh, remains tragic. But if you look at the number of daily deaths, it has plateaued a bit. Uh, and so there is some kind of justification for them to say, 
uh, it makes sense for them to allow the Iraqi government to negotiate with uh, the American government in terms of withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq. Uh, Prime Minister Sudani is coming to Washington in a few weeks. Uh, and so it makes sense to give the government time. But if there is a campaign in Rafa which results in uh, more atrocities, I think it would be very difficult uh, to keep uh, these groups at bay. Uh, and so we're, uh, the, again, there are plenty of risks down the road. Yeah, I was in a, a meeting with a, a senior uh, Arab official uh, who was extremely concerned about the, pos the prospects for uh, an Israeli war on Hezbollah and that depending on how that went, that could reignite, uh, he didn't mention Rafa, but that, that could reignite the, uh, the popular mobilization units, so-called, in, in Iraq, which have uh, stood, stood down uh, for now. Um, I want to start bringing in questions. There are a, a whole bunch that are streaming in online. Some of them are really, uh, are really more comments than, than uh, questions. Um, you know, in, in fairness, there are some here are talking about, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, that uh, Hamas cannot be trusted to distribute aid, that sort of thing. I, I think we have to, we have to understand, uh, you know, that there are very strong feelings about Hamas. This is from one who writes in that Hamas is a fanatic religious group, no civil rights, no women equality, no gay, or, no, no gay equality. Do Americans understand uh, who Israel is up against? Uh, so, you know, despite the fact that we are seeing shifting public opinion, there are still many Americans who obviously also see Israel as justified in what it is, is it, what it is doing in response to to, uh, to the Hamas attacks. And I want to make sure that that we reflect those um, those feelings uh, as well. But let's start with some questions here in the audience, and I will go to the wonderful Ted Katouf. And if you just wait for a microphone, so our online and over here. And yes. say if it's addressed to a particular My speaker. question is addressed to uh, Dr. May, May Rav and Professor Telhami. Uh, you know, whenever there is an outrage committed against Palestinians and it's criticized by the administration or somebody in Congress, they always have to balance it by talking about Palestinian incitement and hatred, et cetera. Uh, I've wondered for a long time, and you do polling in Israel, uh, Shibley, uh, what about, how did, how did the younger demographics in Israel become so right-wing? Um, we saw in May 21, the intercommunal clashes the outpouring of hate and uh, violence on both sides. Uh, there was a study of textbooks back in 2008 or 2009, Israeli textbooks, Palestinian textbooks, textbooks, Orthodox yeshiva textbooks. And basically, the finding financed by the State Department, which later, of course, abjured the report, was that there wasn't really much difference. Neither side totally dehumanized the other but each side gave their narrative in pretty uh, strong form. So uh, talking about before October 7th, uh, you know, wanting to deprogram, some wanting to deprogram Gazans who I've worked with and they're going to Stanford and MIT and University of Chicago and the like. Uh, how did we get here with uh, so many young people in Israel who now comprise the bulk of the IDF? Um, so uh, I'm sure uh, uh, others have um, have a point on that, but let's separate first of all the question of incitement from the question of hardening of the positions of the young people in Israel. Um, there are many reasons for it, but, but one very obvious reason is the demographic change that took place in Israel itself, meaning the larger share of ultra-Orthodox in the population, the Jewish population in particular. So we see that, and you can actually see um, when you look, for example, at the 2015 very large um, uh, pupil uh, uh, among Israelis in general, but especially Israeli Jews, where they broke it down by, you know, Haridim, uh, you know, Datiim, uh, uh, and Chilonim, uh, you, you have the different uh, 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 groupings within the, the Jewish community. You find, you find that uh, uh, the Haridim have the hardest position uh, the most right-wing position 
on attitudes about the, the nature of Israel and about their attitudes toward um, uh, toward Arabs. So that that is a big part of it, frankly. Um, but there is a, the demonization is something a little bit more complicated because it goes way beyond sort of um, strategy of politicians. I, I think in part um, this is something that goes also beyond Israeli-Palestinian. Uh, conflict. It, it's in every conflict we see the demonization taking place. It's a function of whether your assessment is pieces around the corner and therefore you have to start preparing for it, or whether you think it's a constant conflict or escalating conflict, or quote, you have to fight them again, uh, which, which uh, naturally leads to demonization because you cannot fight effectively unless you make the mental, the mental shift toward demonization. So demonization, I think, is really tied to how people read the prospects of uh, peace and war. Uh, and so that's on both sides. For example, if you look back in the Oslo days when people were somewhat hopeful, it was never really perfect hope, but more hopeful, um, very few people uh, in among the Jewish community wanted to expel Palestinians, and very few Palestinians supported uh, attacks against Israelis. Um, uh, when the prospects uh, reduced, uh, uh, became significantly different assessment of the public, uh, positions hardened. So, you know, I think it is all about how people read the conflict. And I say this also in a way to engage a question that Barbara asked. Barbara mentioned, based when reading uh, comments from the audiences, about sort of how people see Hamas. Uh, first of all, by the way, Hamas, um, no matter what, there are, uh, you know, uh, international uh, humanitarian laws that have to be obeyed no matter how bad your uh, enemy is. I mean, that's why those uh, were written. So, it, you know, the fact that you have a horrible enemy does not justify breaking international humanitarian law. And that goes for both Palestinians and Israelis. I mean, that, that goes for everybody yeah, in theory. Uh, but the question about Hamas and its influence, uh, sure, Hamas, you know, a lot of people didn't support it and many people don't like what it stands for. Uh, the question, of course, is that the history didn't start with October 7th for the Palestinians or, for that matter, for the Israelis. And so uh, you already had despair in, uh, the, among the Palestinians among, uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza, pervasive despair. And many of us were predicting violence and eruption no matter what. Now, that doesn't mean that's why Hamas necessarily attacked. But when, when you have hopeful outcome and there's no despair, People, when Hamas does something horrible, say, stop it, you're stopping our prospect for, uh, you know, getting out of this. Uh, and if you are desperate and you see no way out and somebody does something awful, you may look the other way. And that's unfortunately what happens. That's why I think the administration uh, initial idea that somehow uh, Palestinians and Arabs are going to say, well, Hamas is horrible, so therefore let's blame them. And the Israelis are going to say, you see, you know, um, this is where we got. They're going to stop playing Hamas for their own attack, despite the fact uh, that that obviously is what everybody's focused on, is, is their own pain. So I think it's, a, it, it's naive. Uh, I think the administration policy initially was very naive about how public opinion would go. I'm not surprised by any of this. Both we see the polling in, in Israel now and in the Palestinian areas, hardening of positions on both on two states, the prospect of peace between them, uh, but also in terms of uh, support of militant policies, really supporting uh, uh, no ceasefire and going on, uh, continuing the war. Uh, Palestinians are, are increasingly more sympathetic with Hamas. It's what we expect. It's the tragedy. It's, it's what's why you need leadership in the international community to transform the prospects. Mayrav, I wanted to go to you. You actually tweeted out a very... Uh... Uh, upsetting incident. You were at the dentist with one of your kids, right? And uh, I think your, your dental, your, the dentist or the dental hygienist made some, some comments that, that you, you found very shocking. I don't know if you want to repeat the anecdote, but it, it, it does give a sense of where a lot of Israeli sentiment is, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the receptionist was talking about how uh, Israel had just captured um, the Palestinian that they hold responsible for planning the kidnapping of the three teenagers in a settlement in 2014 that then sparked the operation in the West Bank and in Gaza that led to the 50-day war then. 
she, I mean, yeah, it's just an anecdote, but she, she was like, they, they need to torture him a lot. And it was like, you know, at the dentist with kids around and, um, you know, and I just kind of said, well, I don't think that torturing has really led Israel to a better security situation. And she insisted that it had, but, you know, it's not like we engaged in a substantial conversation, but um, I think, you know, it's, it's emblematic of, of, of the fact that Israel has gone with this strong military might approach against the Palestinians over and over and hasn't really come out with a better result. Now you could argue that it had, you know, some sustainability for maybe a couple of decades as far as Israel's concerned. You know, if you look at how Israel crushed the second intifada in the West Bank, I think some in, in Israel would consider that a success. Whether that's a long-term sustainable solution, I don't think so. Um, so, I mean, but that's the Israeli mindset. Um, and in this specific uh, paradigm where you have a multi-front uh, escalation and possibly multi-front war or a war of attrition that could go on for a very long time, the only game in town for Israel is to stay tough and to project power. Um, that's what they understand. Diplomacy has almost never been the, the go-to for Israel, although there have been moments where they, they haven't. And that's why Shibli's right when it you know, is the Israeli body politic is right wing, it's going more right wing, young Israelis as opposed to young Americans are extremely right wing. But if you have a leader who comes in and has a conviction, and a strategy that that could change. Um, I don't believe that, you know, I think Israelis would go go with a different vision if if that vision was properly disseminated. Um, but they haven't had that for a long time. And also the international community has sent a clear message to Israel that it can do as it pleases and it can build settlements forever. Um, and that has had a real toll on how Israelis understand, like Israelis don't understand that there's consequences for actions. It's like, it's like a child who thinks he can get away with things. It really is that simple in a lot of ways. So I'll stop there. <laughs> to add yeah, something there. Stop, sitting here in Washington, I think trying to understand how the Israeli body politic has moved further and further right, really since the birth of the peace process. I, I mean, what Meirav just mentioned, you know, the impunity. I mean, that, that's part of it. I mean, most of the kids who are serving, the youth in the IDF today, have lived almost their entire lives under BB governments, right? Mm -hmm. And those governments, from the, 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 since this last 20 some years of it, have each one of them, each time we say, this is the most right-wing government in Israel's history, they have been more and more right-wing and more and more honest in their outlook, right? All the land is ours. Anyone asks us to give up any of it is anti-Semitic and anti-Israel and doesn't care about our lives. I mean, that's their entire lifetimes. But I also want to make the point that it's not just the impunity. The entire peace process, and I say this as someone who, who worked in the State Department during the Oslo era and worked at Peace Now for years, the entire peace process is based in part on an explicit dehumanization and denial of Palestinian humanity and rights, right? The entire framework of the peace process, it's sort of like Chuck Schumer's comment, you do this because it's good for Israel, not because Palestinians have rights. You end occupation because it's better for Israel's security, not because it's wrong to occupy another people and take their land. You, from the perspective of mm. anyone who's grown up in the peace process era, you have an entire structure approved by the international community of the US and your politicians of yore, which says we're doing this because if we don't do it, bad things will happen to us. And if we do do it, better things will come. And Bibi and company have said for years, from the beginning of the peace process, uh-uh. If we don't do it, nothing bad will happen to us. And we can still get all the great stuff they're promising without doing it. And there is no such thing as Palestinian rights. What Palestinians get are some benefits if they behave well. That is fundamentally dehumanizing. You now have generations of Israelis who don't see the West Bank. They don't see occupation unless they're soldiers. And when they're soldiers, they understand it strictly through the lens of we are defending Jewish land, Jewish rights against terrorism. And that's it. It's a very simple, simple framing. The politics of the current Israeli government are Kahanist. This is Meyer Kahane. You can go back and look at it. And it's very absolutist and it's very satisfying. And it's extremely natural because this has been the policy even in the peace process era when I'll remind people the biggest argument that was used by the left in the peace process era was the demographic threat. If you don't make peace, the Arabs will have many, many more babies, then they'll outnumber us. It was never, 
it's wrong for us to systematically deny people rights. So if Palestinian kids are angry at Israelis, it's because the, the school books are inciting them. They talk about we have to reprogram Palestinian kids in Gaza because I'm certain they didn't learn anything. The fact that a 15-year-old in Gaza right now is now four wars old, five wars old, the Visualizing Palestine did this great visual where you can see how many wars old they are. I'm sure that's not what makes them resent and hate Israelis. It's because their books told them to. <laughs> I mean, that's the world we're living in, and that is, a, that is a paradigm that the international community and the U.S. have not only authored, but we continue to endorse. There are no Palestinian rights. There are only benefits that can accrue if they behave well. And as, as, as Shibley said, anyone who's watching on the ground has been saying for years, this is going to explode, not because of anti-Semitism or bloodlust, but because this is untenable. Wouldn't you explode if this were you? And you will hear Israelis say, yeah, if I were a Palestinian in Gaza, I'd be fighting back. Um, I wanted to ask this one online question. I know that we have a lot of questions in the room. This is from Carl Indefirth, um, former U.S. official, uh, very distinguished gentleman. He wants to know whether others have stepped up to fill the gap in UNRWA funding um, and whether the 12-month the, the ban on U.S. funding has gone into effect. I think the U.S. stopped in January anyway funding. Uh, yeah, so the US, right? the U.S. suspended funding already. Um, so this is already is just continuing what is already the policy. Um, since the allegations by Israel of uh, a small number, it's like 12 people out of 13,000 being directly involved, and as I understand it, there still hasn't been evidence produced, um, a whole lot of countries cut off aid. Most of them have by now resumed aid. Um, I think based on both the fact that Israel has still not given evidence of a pervasive Hamas engagement of UNRWA, um, again, 12 people, even if that's true, out of 13,000 does not show that UNRWA is a, a front for Hamas. Um, but also because there is a famine, <laughs> right? That's why the, the U.S. policy, I, I wrote that it was, it was a, a, a moral obscenity, um, that right now you're cutting off aid. Mm -hmm. So the aid is now restarting from a lot of, um, a lot of countries. The U.S. is giving aid through the World Food Program, I believe. Uh, the U.S. is giving aid through, but fundamentally being able to distribute on the ground. Anybody who's watched um, Jose, Chef Jose Andres, right? World Central Kitchen, the hero of the story right now. Yeah. But he's very clear, if you're not going to have UNRWA, there's nobody, no one has capacity to distribute. And Israel now is assassinating the Palestinian officials, who are police officials, who are involved in distributing on the ground based on arguing that they are Hamas officials, bearing in mind that for 16 years Hamas has ruled and everyone who works for the government by the Israeli calculation, is now a Hamas official. Um, it's sort of like, you know, debathification in Iraq, where we're going to kill everyone who had any civil service or security position, and then there's, there's no one to deal with. So they're not, uh, UNRWA's capacity has certainly not been replaced on the ground. There's nobody else who can do what they do. And the funding, the funding crunch continues. Yeah. Um, gentleman right there with the cap and the beard. Thank you, Ms. Slavin. Uh, my question is uh, with Mr. Ali and also Ms. Slavin, if you could also uh, pitch in on that. I'm very curious to know where do we see Iran's uh, strategic footprint in the years from now? As you very rightly mentioned, the Arab official you were talking to who said he has fear of the, uh, the popular mobilization forces being reignited in the region, and also Houthi's capabilities, uh, although they're not proxy, uh, proxies of uh, Iran, but there is a record uh, uh, partnership in terms of defense and other things as well between both the entities. So I'm very curious to know, and also in the information space, we see a whole new level of credibility being established for these non-state actors, particularly members of the Iranian uh, Access of prox Proxy Group. So, and on the domestic side, there has been the lowest, record lowest turnout in the general elections as well. So keeping all these moving bits and parts in mind, what do you suggest, uh, how do you see Iran's role going forward in terms of managing its uh, proxy network? Is it going to blow out of proportion or is it going to be in control? Let me add on one other thing that we had talked about earlier, which is Iran's nuclear program and whether you think that the situation in Gaza, if it, if it expands, could actually finally affect Iran's decision whether or not to, to make a nuclear weapon. Sure. So look, I think uh, this experience in the past six months has been a mixed bag for Iran because on the one hand, it has been able to demonstrate that this network, which was created primarily to deter uh, attacks on Iran's soil, 
uh, actually has the capacity that Iran was looking for to turn any kind of bilateral confrontation with Iran into a regional conflagration, right? The, the ability to project power all the way from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean through the Red Sea is quite impressive. A number of groups, number of actors who can work more or less uh, in, with high coordination with one another, uh, it's, it's real power, right? However, um, it also in the process, Iran has demonstrated how reluctant it is to use these groups for anything less than defense of its homeland, right? Uh, so this is not a formula in which you have, you know, all for one and one for all. Um, <laughs> they are willing to sacrifice uh, a lesser of, uh, member of this axis like Hamas, uh, uh, but and Iran is not willing to sacrifice Hezbollah for defending Hamas or the Palestinians because Hezbollah is a crown jewel of this forward defense policy, uh, primarily aimed at preserving Iran itself. Right, so it's a mixed picture, uh, uh, and uh, in the process, I think there are other points of vulnerability that have come to surface. Um, if you look at the kind of uh, uh, retaliation that the U.S. has engaged in, for instance, killing very senior uh, officials, uh, even what Israel has done in Syria. Uh, you know, in the past uh, uh, six months, we've had at least 11 commander of the IRGC that have been assassinated by Israel in Syria. And this is such a break from the pattern of the past few years, whereas we, we used to have lots of Israeli attacks on Iranian assets in Syria, but there was this tradition of uh, giving a, a, a ring to cell phone of uh, uh, personnel on the ground so that they would know uh, that an attack is coming to minimize casualties. Uh, but now attacks are aimed at killing uh, Iranians uh, and IRGC. Uh, and, and you see that Iran cannot retaliate in kind. Uh, even the rhetoric of revenge uh, that we used to hear from Iran when the U.S. killed uh, General Soleimani in 2020, all of that is gone. Because the Iranians understand the limit of, of their power. Um, and they have paid a huge price. Again, the U.S. has also killed people. This network works on personal relations, right? So when the U.S. killed in re response to Ta Tower 22 Abu Bakr in Iraq, this is a man who had been operating in that field for more than three decades, had lots of personal uh, connections. Of course, it's a, you can say it's the price of doing business, and at the end of the day, uh, everybody's replaceable, but you will lose a lot with losing personalities uh, who, who have uh, 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 networks. Um, the risk here, which is something that I don't see anyone really thinking about much in the U.S. or in Israel, uh, is that in a scenario in which we um, uh, move in a direction that this mixed picture changes and becomes actually quite negative for Iran's uh, regional deterrence, uh, right? Um, we might end up in a situation that Iran might try to compensate that loss of security uh, that it used to get through its forward defense through another option. And what's the other option available to it? It's, it's nuclear capability, right? It's closer than ever to the verge of nuclear weapons. So in a scenario, for instance, that we have uh, a confrontation between Israel and Hezbollah, which is going to be extremely costly and disastrous, no doubt about it, but of course uh, uh, Israel will prevail at the end. Uh, we might reach a new degree of deterrence. Uh, but in the process, Hezbollah's capabilities will be diminished. There is no doubt about this, right? This is the reason uh, Israel wants to. Uh, engage in, in that confrontation to weaken Hezbollah. Now, if you're Iran and uh, uh, your regional deterrence has been weakened, and also you're in a situation that you don't see uh, any possibility of using your nuclear leverage at the negotiating table to get sanctions relief, mm. then the most obvious option is to go for the ultimate deterrent, right? So that's, I'm, I'm afraid that the more Israel succeeds in weakening Iran's regional deterrence, the more it fails with creating even a bigger problem for itself, right? Because once Iran is sitting behind a nuclear shield, then it will be in the same situation that Russia is today, right? Uh, uh, everybody can help Ukraine, but nobody dares touching Russia itself. Well, that's a depressing thought. I, I, I did want to read this one uh, positive note. This is. Uh, uh, don't forget Menachem Begin was a right-wing leader. He was considered a terrorist until 1948, and he signed a peace agreement with Egypt. Don't lose hope. So 
there is, <laughs> there is, I suppose, uh, always the possibility of, of a shift. I wanted to ask Mirav, I, I know one of the sticking points in the negotiations over a ceasefire has been the release of Palestinian prisoners. Have you, has anyone been able to see a list of who might be released by Israel? Uh, I know there's been reference to people who have blood on their hands, um, which would suggest uh, perhaps Maran Barghouti might be among them. Yeah, I think at some point Hamas did uh, announce that Amarwan Barghouti would be one of the prisoners they would want released. Um, I'm certainly not privy to the list and I'm not sure that anybody except for those in the negotiations are. Um, but I know that Israel on that claims that it has actually become more flexible and would uh, release uh, larger numbers of prisoners. And I think that on some of those prisoners, it would be demanding that they be exiled, that they cannot remain either in Gaza or the West Bank. Um, but I, I really think that the prisoner issue is that even though the idea is that, you know, Hamas has always operated in a way of, of um, kind of attack in order to release its prisoners, it's like people attribute seen wanting to having that be a priority. Uh, but in this case, I really don't think that that's a major issue uh, right now. Um, I think that's something that's e the, the most easily solvable issue um, of all the issues. Of course, it's uh, a point that the far right can play up very much and, um, and oppose in a hostage deal, which they oppose anyway for all kinds of reasons. But, um, but yeah, I don't think that that's a, a real sticking point. And sticking point is, is Hamas's demand that, is, that Israel agree to a permanent ceasefire and withdraw from Gaza. That's, yeah, that's, and it's been consistent from the very beginning. And there's also the issue of returning uh, Gazans who are internally displaced back up north um, into northern Gaza, um, which is something that they're demanding and Israel for various reasons is preventing. Uh, although, you know, in some ways, if Israel wants to operate in Rafah and have some kind of uh, legitimacy to do that, it has to move that population back up in some level. So in, in some ways, Israel is just in a corner and not able to really to do something that would work for anyone in, in either scenario. This gentleman here has been very patient. If I could get a microphone to him. Yeah. Hello, thank you. I really appreciate the ideas of the two beautiful scholars in black, which gives us hope that there is still some good to come from the United States. And uh, my question here is to please don't mind my very uh, br uh, frank, brutally frank question. One is that Hamas is terrorist and I condemn that. But then the state of Israel has killed 27 times more people than Hamas did on October 7. So is it fair to say that is the state of Israel is 27 times bigger terrorist than Hamas. And secondly, I would like to ask, since most of the political and military muscle that Israel draws to conduct its crimes against humanity is given by the US, so will it be fair to call the US a state sponsor of terrorism? <laughs> I think your question actually contained answers <laughs> within it. Um, let me, you know, let's, let's, let's give a little history here. You know, over, as the, as the, the person who he, on, online noted, uh, Menachem Begin, who was Prime Minister of Israel, had been a terrorist uh, before the creation of, of, uh, of the state. We all know that Yasser Arafat and the PLO were considered a terrorist organization for many, many years. And then in 1988, the Palestinians had a meeting in Algiers, which I actually attended as a journalist, where they recognized Israel's right to exist. Uh, they, of course, they were late. They recognized the 1948 partition, uh, you know, 40, 40 years too late. So, um, you know, we have a, a horrible situation where uh, there are prospects for peace which, which become frustrated. We have, we, we condemn various individuals and organizations for actions that, that are terrorism, frankly. Uh, but it doesn't get us any closer to a solution because often those same people are the ones, the only ones who have the 
support, the popular support necessary to actually make peace. You know, so Arafat was able to, to agree to the Oslo Accords. Uh, it didn't work out for a variety of reasons, among them Bibi Netanyahu's terrible leadership, a number of failed peace summits. We had a second intifada that broke out. And what did the Israelis do? They imprisoned Yasser Arafat in his headquarters in Ramallah. He eventually became very sick and died. And instead of Yasser Arafat, we got Mahmoud Abbas, who is now considered to be uh, and for a long time has been considered to be incapable of really uh, serving the interests of Palestinians or negotiating any kind of permanent settlement. So I think there has to come a point in time when you stop labeling people and start being pragmatic and dealing with those who have the ability to make decisions that, that can be supported by their, their populations. Um, but the United States, you know very well, especially since September 11, 2001, we have made an industry out of terrorism designations, sanctions, uh, and it has not gotten us, it seems, any closer to, to the peaceful solutions that we seek. So that's my editorial. Faye, please. Uh, Barbara, thank you for such a great program and a great panel. Uh, my question is how effective is foreign policy in a presidential election? So mm. an average American goes to a poll, do they That's think about the question. foreign policy, whether it's Gaza or uh, Iran's nuclear there when they vote for a president? And isn't this uh, one of the uh, points that uh, Bibi Netanyahu is counting on mm. that it wouldn't make a difference what happens? Thank you. Yeah, that's a question for Shibley, but I want to add yeah, one, yeah. one piece into it, Shibley, and that is even Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee, has said that Israel is damaging its reputation and it should finish the war. So, um, which I thought was an interesting comment coming from, from Trump. Yeah, what role does foreign policy typically play? Does it, on occasion, say the Iraq War, Vietnam War, uh, play a role, but not usually? How do you see it in the past and now? Yeah, it, it has always played a role with certain segments of the public. The question, it's always about, you know, what are the public priorities? But one way to understand this is um, that even when the issue itself may not be ranked as a priority in the public mind, the assessment of leaders are tied to what they do on those issues. So for example, uh, one reason why young people are angry with Biden. They're angry with him because his behavior since he came to office, as I said, back even dating back to May 2021, um, has gone against what they assumed about him, his own character. So it undermined his own character as a president in their eyes. And foreign policy in this particular case, particularly when it comes to the Gaza war, I think what you see is that it's become a prototype for what the U.S. stands for. We're in the middle of a values war. And, and this issue of Gaza is a prototype for uh, our drive for particular, for human rights, for international law, for the kind of world we want to see at a time when we're fighting for all these values at home and abroad. So yes, it does matter. And I think that um, one of the things that Biden is banking on, some of it is true, is that uh, when many of us who are angry with Biden on this issue, when uh, push comes to shove and you're going to have Biden versus Trump, uh, that people are going to say, I'm not going to let Trump win. And, and I, a lot of people are, maybe most people are in that camp, for sure, yes. And so they're going to put aside their anger, even as deeply angry as they are on Gaza, and probably vote for Trump. Most people, most Democrats, many independents, some Republicans. Biden. The problem is whether there will be, whether there will be enough of a uh, segment uh, that says, I cannot bring myself to vote for Biden, even if I don't like Trump. They will either sit at home and not vote, not be mobilized, not go and recruit people to vote for Biden, not. Uh, you know, contribute to the campaign uh, or vote for a third party candidate as a protest, not, you know, not for anything else. So it could hurt Biden significantly. And we've already seen that in some of the uh, reactions in, in places like Michigan. Uh, so it's not the central issue of the day, 
but it's an important issue of the day. And because of the scale of horror that we're witnessing, that goes to what we stand for as a country, as a people, as a as a as a democracy, as um, uh, what what values do we cherish? All of that is wrapped into it and tied to our assessment of the character of the president of the United States. So it's going to matter how much we don't know. Um, I have a very tough question here uh, that's been submitted by um, a guy named Roy Gutman, who is a former journalist, someone I've known for years. He, I believe he won a Pulitzer for covering famine in Africa uh, back in the 1980s. He's got a really tough question. And if you don't want to answer, you don't have to answer. Uh, I, will, I will answer. Do all members of the panel agree with Lara that Israel is committing an ongoing genocide? Um, I would not use that word because I do not, the, the effect may be genocidal, but I do not believe that the intent is genocidal. That is my own personal view. I don't see it as equivalent to the Houthis and the Tutsis in Rwanda or the Nazis' uh, elimination of six million Jews. That's just my personal view. I, I would counter that the definition of genocide under international law does not require it to meet that, that bar. Um, the International Court of Justice, in looking at this, sound, found a probable case for probable genocide based on the they clearly articulated ruled, intent. The probable case based on the clearly articulated intent. It does not have to rise to the trying to kill every member of a race in the world. That's simply not, that's not the bar under international law, even though I think that is intuitively what most people think of. It can't be genocide if it doesn't kill everybody. That isn't, that isn't what it means under, under international law. Does anybody else want to touch that? And if you don't, that's quite all right. Raise your hand if you I mean, do. I would, <laughs> I, I would just say that uh, on the intent, actually, it's more debatable because of the rhetoric that we've heard coming out of Israel. Um, but, I, you know, to, without getting too much in the weeds of the, I'm not an expert on the legal definitions of genocide. Obviously, I'm well aware of what's been happening and the hearings. But I think in some ways, it's very important to name it what it is. I'm not saying it's not. But at this point, that's distracting from, from what's happening on the ground, which is a disaster of epic proportions. And this, again, is not, this is not new, what Israel's been doing to the Palestinian people for decades. This is just on a much worse and larger scope. And it has a lot more legitimacy to do it because of October 7th, uh, the dispossession, the disenfranchisement, the dehumanization, um, just preventing them from, ha from, from living. And so there's different levels to that. There's different peaks to that. This is a very big peak. Some call it genocide, some don't. You know, that, I don't think that's the issue here. The, I mean, again, it is an issue, but the real issue is how do, we, how do we get to a place where people can live with dignity and freedom? That's, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have time, I think, for one or two more questions. So this gentleman has been very patient. Let's uh, go to him. Hi. Um, let me identify myself. Augusta Salzona, Asian, Filipino, Catholic American. I've lived uh, in this town since 1952. I've seen U.S. presidents come and go, Philippine presidents come and go, various lobbies come and go. A lot of lobbies, those lobbyists are still here, though, haven't left. <laughs> Their kids are here. But anyway, the <laughs> um, question is this. Uh, basically, um, I guess uh, this is addressed to you all and your bosses and who's ever paying your, your, your salaries, et cetera. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you don't care to answer the question yourself. Uh, basically, it's this is when, when will the West, including America, and then you can actually maybe throw in Israel in there, uh, it being a socialist democracy, by the way, uh, that um, ever learned that war crimes and genocide has consequences. Uh, I thought here in the 21st century we'd be getting a, away from the, it, the the sins of the of the 20th century. So, to that, if you don't care to answer that, my question is, is what, would, what would you advise the next president of the United States, whether it be <laughs> Donald Trump or Joe Biden, concerning the, middle, uh, concerning the Middle East? That was the same question I posed to Henry Kissinger in 2015. And, what did he say? Uh, he said he, he, he also answered it concerning Putin. He said that uh, um, 
the West, America needs to prepare for the redrawing of the map of the Middle East. And then he also said we need to, uh, the West needs to prepare for a post-Putin Russia. And if that didn't send a signal out to every single other country in the world, I don't know what did, but he's right. dead now, well. and so is the 20th century, hopefully. Does anybody want to offer any, uh, any um, policy well, prescriptions for the next president, be it second-term Biden or, or uh, if I Trump? may, uh, if, if I may, I, I have, you know, um, a, an article in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, the March-April issue with Mark Lynch called The Two-State Mirage. And, and the idea is not that we oppose two-state, and many uh, here know that I have been a supporter of two states uh, before it was popular, and I worked hard uh, formally and informally to make it happen um, even before Oslo. Um, uh, but rather that um, my worry that this talk of two states now or reviving diplomacy uh, at a time when we see the devastation on the horror, whatever you call it, uh, it is an unacceptable uh, um, humanitarian catastrophe that's man-made that's human made. And um, it is um, one that is not likely to lead to any prospects of peace, especially given uh, the kind of psychology in Israel and the Palestinian community now, uh, but also what is required on the ground. And therefore, my fear is it would distract from what needs to be done, which is end the killing, um, uh, pro 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 provide humanitarian aid uh, um, and look for a long-term solution down the road. Uh, my, therefore, our recommendation was not to use this promise of two states as a smokescreen, uh, but rather to stop being complicit. Uh, one of the questioners asked about the role of the US. Uh, part of the problem, whatever you call uh, what's happening in Gaza, whether you call it genocide, atrocities, um, 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 the violation of international law, war crimes, um, it is on a horrific scale. Let the lawyers uh, hammer out uh, what they will label it for legal uh, reasons, but it is unacceptable. It is something that uh, goes against our values for most of us, against international law as we understand it, against international humanitarian law. And part of the problem has been that we have been complicit, the, the United States of America, our government has been complicit uh, in uh, these events. And when there are no consequences, uh, when the US does not follow through in defending those principles, you're essentially uh, uh, supporting them uh, indirectly and making them happen. And and therefore our, our um, a um, um, recommendation has been to st start holding uh, viola violators of international law uh, and, and uh, those who, who carry out um, um, war crimes to account. And if in fact the International Court of Justice decides that what's happening uh, is genocide, then that has implications for the United States. And the U.S. therefore should be judging Israel and the Palestinians on their behavior, not on some prospect of an outcome that is not likely to materialize. Uh, even if you can't solve the problem on your own or with others, stop being part of the problem and start being part of the solution uh, by uh, assuring that there are consequences. Um. Final thoughts from our other panelists? Uh, Shibley, I don't know, when you, when you say consequences, do you mean going as far as, as stopping certain kinds of military aid or? Oh, absolutely. I think, yeah. I, think as, as, I mean, when, you, when, you're, when you're saying or observing uh, the kind of violations of human rights, and, um, as many centers have, have, have argued, even violations of American law, let alone international humanitarian law, and you don't condition military aid on behavior, uh, what do you expect? Uh, I mean, there's no question that that is something that is essential uh, to assert uh, uh, American influence uh, in, and to, to influence the events down the road in the Middle East.
All right. Um, let's see. One more question? One more question, quickly. Yes, go for it. And then we will close. Um, so even as the U.S. and Israel negotiate with Hamas to, for the ceasefire and, and to release hostages, there's rhetoric coming from both administrations that Hamas can't be part of the, of the negotiations for long-term peace. Um, I guess my question is that um, given the fact that that sort of rhetoric that denies agency to, a pal to Palestinians to pick their own leadership has resulted in the growth and popularity of Hamas, how realistic and pragmatic is it to think that Hamas can be eliminated from a long-term negotiated settlement? Yeah, I'm going to pass that last question, that last hot potato, to Meirav. Well, I mean, I think it's a good question, and I think we're we're seeing that it's not it, the way to to win with Hamas is not the way that Israel is doing it. It's not to military militarily pummel them. That's not going to be the answer. So even if we even if we for a second agree that Israel's war is legitimate and the effort is right, the question is how to get there. And I think from past experiences, the U.S. has had this experience and others. It's not the way that Israel's doing it. It's going to have to be a political diplomatic solution. And it's important, we call it the Israel-Gaza war, but it's the Israel-Palestine war. This is a war of Israelis and Palestinians. And uh, you're right that they aren't given agency. We saw what happened when they elected Hamas uh, in 2006. Um, and nobody in the world is gonna support elections at this point. Um, so you're, you're stuck because the Palestinians need political representation. They deserve a political leadership that represents their interests. And part of the reason why Hamas is so popular is because they haven't had that and because the world hasn't let them have that. Um, so, I, you know, I think clearly the strategy has to change. Uh, if you want to, um, to beat Hamas, then you need to uh, think about how to integrate it on some level into a future post-war scenario. That's just the practical way, regardless of the moral standing either way. I want to thank uh, my guests. Uh, this, these topics are not easy. And obviously, uh, you know, if we had brilliant solutions, we would be telling you them right now. But I think it's very important to look at the shifts, not just in the region, but also here in the United States. And uh, I thank you for coming. I thank those who are online. And let me thank Merav and Shibli and Ali and Lara for their uh, very candid uh, and forthright remarks. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.